morning, everyone. Uh, good morning here in the UK, where I'm calling in from. Good afternoon in Hong Kong uh, and parts of Asia, and welcome to this event from the Asian Racing Federation, Council on Anti-Illegal Betting and Related Financial Crime, in association today with the Mekong Club. Uh, my name is Martin Ferbrick, and uh, I'm the chair of the ARF Council, and I'll moderate the discussion today. So just to remind you of who we are, uh, ARF Council is part of the Asian Racing Federation. That's a regional racing federation comprising 28 national racing authorities uh, from across Asia, Oceania, Africa, and the Middle East. It stretches a very long way uh, up to Turkey, across to South Africa. So it's a, it's a very large geographical federation. Uh, we're very proud to uh, be part of it with this organization, ARF Council, which was established in 2017 now comprises 24 members, individual members, that is, from organizations uh, involved in racing, sports integrity, law enforcement, the UNODC, and academia. Uh, and just a little more about the, uh, the ARF Council, for those of you who don't know us, our purpose is to foster international cooperation um, in regard to the threat of illegal betting, illegal gambling, related financial crimes, their threats to all sports and the wider negative impact on society. Um, so we've been around since about 2017, but actually we've been doing the work for quite a few years before that. So um, we built up quite a set of knowledge on this. Um, a partner working with us uh, on this webinar and also on the report that we're going to talk about is the Mekong Club. Uh, I think many of you will know that as um, a, a not-profit entity in, that works with the private sector to bring about sustainable practices against modern slavery around the world. Um, although I think the Mekong Club is largely based in Hong Kong, but they have a global impact with, which shows their strength and how well regarded they are. Um, so our subject today for discussion is how organized crime operates illegal betting, cyber scams, and modern slavery in Southeast Asia. Although as we were just discussing before we opened up the, the webinar, I think our focus is probably a lot wider than Southeast Asia because the problem is, is far wider geographically. Um, and that subject is the title of a new report from the Era Council, which is produced in collaboration with the Mekong Club and, and led by James Porteous, who's um, one of our panelists today. So we very much acknowledge the leadership of the Mekong Club in raising awareness regarding modern slavery. And, and I must, of course, call out Matt Friedman, uh, CEO and founder of the Mekon Club, who unfortunately is traveling at the moment. He was going to be on our panel today. But also, so I'd like to thank Matt, but also I'd like to thank the, the team at the Mekon Club, uh, Phoebe Ewan, uh, Viral Buta, uh, C.G. Lim, Katerina Doty, um, Adrienne Yu, who were essential to the production of this report, and, and Doris Mao from the ARF Council, who worked with James. Uh, so it's, it's a significant report. I do hope you'll take time to look at it online uh, and read through it. It's quite digestible, but it's an important report at this time. So our two panelists, James Porteous is Senior Due Diligence and Research Manager at the Hong Kong Jockey Club. That's his day job. Uh, the ARF Council is, uh, I'm not sure if it's night job or, um, or uh, when you do the work, James. It's a lot of work, I know. Uh, James's team conducts research into global legal betting markets. Their links to transnational organized crime and the negative impact on society. Uh, prior to joining the Jockey Club, James was a journalist, a sports journalist, I, I think I should say, but I think he's written a lot of other things as well, uh, with the Herald in Glasgow originally, uh, and later the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong. Uh, so James led the research and writing of this report, uh, How Organized Crime Operates in Legal Betting, Cyber Scams, Modern Slavery, um, and I would say is an expert on, on this subject um, in relation to a lot of other areas as well. Uh, also, we have Patricia Ho, founder of the Hong Kong Dignity Institute, founding and managing partner of Patricia Ho and Associates, and also principal lecturer of the Faculty of Law at the University of Hong Kong. But that's a lot of work. I don't think Patricia get much, gets much sleep, probably. Uh, she's obviously a very busy person, three jobs, you could say. Um, and that shows her commitment to some of the, uh, the areas in which she works. Uh, much of her work involves defending the rights of minority groups in Hong Kong, by way of seeking advancements and developments of government policies and laws through strategic litigation. Um, and you can see uh, the law library behind Patricia indicating uh, her role as a legal counsel. Uh, I would highlight some of that work in litigation. Uh, in particular, 2015, Patricia representing a client to bring a judicial review uh, against the Secretary of Justice and ORS to encourage the government to consider 
introducing specific legislation to criminalize forced labor and human trafficking. I think this is important because um, Patricia uh, not only works as an advocate in this area, but um, is a co-author of the Crimes Amendment Modern Slavery Bill 2019. I think it's particularly impressive when you have advocates and activists who not only speak about the subject they, uh, they're passionate about, but do something quite tangible about it. And writing a piece of draft law is, is something very tangible. So we're, we're really privileged to have Patricia here as well. Uh, so for attendees today, we're on the Zoom webinar platform. As you can see, the videos and microphones can't be displayed. Only the panelists can be heard, but uh, we do want to hear from you. So please could you raise questions or comments through the Zoom chat function um, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll note them and we'll come to them in due course. But first of all, we're going to have some opening remarks obviously from James and Patricia. So perhaps we'll kick off with James, if you don't mind. Uh, James, because you've written this report um, and we were talking before we started, how many people are involved in being trafficked in Asia through some of these compounds that um, we're now starting to understand. Uh, the numbers are quite staggering and, and scary. Um, so these operations are run by individuals with long histories of involvement in illegal betting. You said this in the report. Um, and the profits from this, which we've researched for many years in regard to the, the business of illegal betting and gambling, uh, up to 100 billion a year US dollars uh, or, or more. I mean, obviously putting numbers on this is difficult. So there's a stagger. I think the business is interesting to note. But there's clearly a staggering scale of human suffering, which which we noted from this report. I think this is the difference in other reports that um, it, you and I and our team have written about the subject area. Here you're talking about the human suffering, which is um, which should be a great concern to everyone. So how did this come about? I think if you could take us through the report, uh, explain where this problem came from. And, and talk about the organized crime and, and, and where it is now. Um, over to you, James. Um, thanks, Martin, and thanks everybody for joining. Um, I've got a, a short presentation which will just summarize some of the content in the report and hopefully answer that question. Um, you know, first of all, I, I do want to stress that the report is entirely based on, on public sources. Um, and it relies on the work done by a host of um, journalists, NGOs, um, and, and different groups who are uh, like on the ground in these places in Asia, in Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, and elsewhere. And I, I really want to stress that because you know they're they can literally be putting themselves in harm's way because, as we'll see, some of the people involved in this industry are not very nice people and you know it's it's kind of easy for me i'm glad i'm just sitting behind a desk kind of collating some of the excellent work that's out there um and and when you read the report you know there is it's all referenced in footnotes and and in the acknowledgments to those people so um yeah as you said martin so what is a what is a racing organization doing talking about human trafficking and modern slavery? You know, we we did start looking at the issue of illegal betting as a threat to the integrity of the sport of horse racing some years ago. And but what we quickly found was that illegal betting is not just a victimless crime. It's not just a, a competitive threat to legal betting. It's actually a pillar um, funding organized crime and, and increasingly this is a transnational organized crime issue it's a global issue and really i think um, as you said it's quite frightening the what we found in this particular report and really underlines that fact you know um the slide here says we estimated tens of thousands are held in these modern slavery type conditions in what are called casino compounds across Southeast Asia. Uh, these aren't like the glitzy, glamorous casinos you might have in your mind. They're they're quite grim concrete blocks with literally thousands of people serving primarily online illegal betting. And as we've found that that's metastasized into this factory production cyber fraud system. 
We've estimated tens of thousands. I think the number is actually probably a lot larger. We were just saying before the call that the, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime has published a recent report where they estimate it in the hundreds of thousands. And this is leading to billions in profits. Again, we've said tens of billions here. It's, it's more likely to be hundreds of billions. Um, you know, it, it's really impossible to put an accurate figure on it, but by all accounts and any estimates, the sums involved are huge. So whatever the actual figures of people held in these terrible conditions and the billions that is funding organized crime, whatever the actual figures are, they're massive. And the groups that are running these across Asia and increasingly even beyond, you know, they have been involved in the illegal betting industry for decades, since the 1990s at least. Um, and essentially, they got involved in online betting in the early 2000s when that took off. And in the 2015-17 range, they've adapted that technology into cyber scams and cyber frauds. And that really kind of turbocharged during COVID for reasons we'll explain. So they now not just have the very profitable illegal online betting, they also have this other business line, which is at, at least as profitable. And as many groups such as the UN, uh, Interpol and others have pointed out, this is now a global threat. Um, so some definitions first, you know, wh what is human trafficking? Essentially, it's, it's recruiting people typically under deception, deception, false promises, transferring them and keeping them captive against their will um, to exploit them for profit. Um, the, the Mekong Club and other groups have estimated that there's millions, perhaps 50 million people who are victims of this worldwide. And the modus operandi, is, as seen on the bottom of the screen, is deceive them, promises of fake jobs. You hold, you seize their passports, you hold them in debt bondage with spurious debts. People are even sold between organizations and they are threatened with violence um, or actually subject to violence uh, for to keep them in line or for not meeting targets and so on. And, and all of these factors, sometimes quite graphically, have been publicly reported in relation to this online betting and cyber scam industry. Um, illegal betting. Uh, is any any betting um, that takes place uh, with, where the operator is not licensed to operate. Um, uh, uh, the ARF defines this. This can be completely unlicensed and unregulated, but it can also be licensed and what we call licensed but underregulated. So, for example, some of the groups we talk about, they, they might have gambling licenses in the Philippines or from Cambodia, they take bets um, from all over Asia, especially China, Greater China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, India, and even beyond Asia, where obviously they're not licensed. Um, this is a massive, massive industry. The UN has estimated it at upwards of 1.7 trillion in turnover a year. And our own research at the ARF has found that it's growing almost twice as fast as the licensed and regulated legal betting industry. And that's simply because you know, it's not constrained by any sort of regulation. Um, and it obviously has a highly negative social impact in that it's funding organized crime and there are other businesses in drug trafficking, wildlife trafficking, et cetera. And there's zero benefits to society through taxation or other means. Uh, why is Asia a hub? You know, I think this map illustrates it quite well. You have massive populations, many with a kind of cultural appetite for gambling, but very few limited, well-regulated legal options to fill that demand. And organized crime has always filled that supply-demand gap. But, you know, what was kind of a street-level activity, you know, before the internet has really been turbocharged by the internet so that this is now a, a trillion dollar plus uh, industry. And, you know, Asia, yes, it's a hub with many of the people running it and many of the operations, but the impact is global. They take bets from all over the world, 
the corrupt sport and racing all over the world. And the huge profits impact global populations, you know, whether that's real estate bubbles in Canada or Australia or the laundering of the proceeds into financial centers in Hong Kong and London, the corruption of officialdom and sport, and of course, global trafficking of people to work and serve these operations. Um, illegal betting has been called a pillar for organized crime. And the reason for that is because the profits are extremely high, as we've mentioned. It's very low risk. It's not typically a priority for law enforcement, which have many competing priorities. Uh, and the penalties are typically low if you do get caught. And then it provides useful capital to fund your other businesses, um, whether legitimate or illegitimate. And this case study really exemplifies all that. Um, Sun City was what was called a Macau junket operator. Uh, their professed purpose was to bring gamblers to Macau casinos, but for various reasons, they essentially became uh, massive underground banking and organized money laundering systems uh, with very close association to Chinese organized crime or triad societies. And Sun City's profits at their peak rival those of the biggest Macau casinos. And, and when you consider that Macau in its heyday pre-COVID was doing five to seven times the revenue of Las Vegas, you get an, an impression of the scale of the sums involved. And indeed, that was only the reported sums. There was at least as much happening under the table as well. They also had massive online betting, illegal betting, and uh, reported at 145 billion US dollars a year in China alone which was being operated out of the Philippines, Cambodia, and uh, quote unquote licensed, but under-regulated in the Philippines and indeed the Isle of Man. Uh, the gentleman on the screen was uh, jailed for 18 years. He was the CEO of the group. Uh, he was sentenced to 18 years in Macau this year for 162 charges, including illegal gambling, money laundering, criminal association. He's publicly alleged to have very close links to the 14K triad society. And indeed, is many public links to individuals, locations, companies who are mentioned in our report across Asia. Um, and just as an aside, you can see that there's a nice picture of a nice thoroughbred breeding stud farm behind him. You know, th these guys were and are interested in horse racing, which is why we first started paying attention to them. Obviously, a huge threat to the integrity of our sport. Uh, however, so he's in jail, and as are many of his associates, but obviously this massive business continues, and this model is far from unique. There are several others with essentially the exact same model who are still active and still running this massive illegal betting industry. Uh, so how did this illegal betting industry become linked to cyber scams? In, essentially, it's the same technology, people, infrastructure involved. You, if you think of the technology you need to set up these massive networks of illegal betting, you need IT experts to set up thousands of anonymized websites and run your crypto funds transfers and other, other online payments out of the eyes of regulators. Um, you need hundreds of thousands of staffs to recruit customers um, to to market the, the services on chat apps, messaging apps, social media. Um, you need customer support to explain to your customers how to evade internet restrictions, how to set up crypto accounts, etc. And you need infrastructure, which is where these casino compounds across Southeast Asia come in. These are large compounds, self-contained mini cities with supermarkets and restaurants and everything where people aren't allowed to leave and they're held for to work 13 hours plus a day in these type of roles. Um, and it obviously also helps if you have compliant local officials who are, um, you know, either have been bribed or, or will look the other way. So all of these, all of these um, skills, infrastructure, people were easily repurposed to cyber scams, probably around 2016 type range, but it really accelerated during COVID. Um, and, and so how does this business lead to human trafficking? Well, as we said, hundreds of thousands of workers are required. Um, and certainly, certainly pre-COVID, 
primarily Chinese speakers. That's now changed and people are being trafficked from all over the globe. But because the market in China was so large, it was Chinese speakers primarily. Um, before the pandemic, there was trafficking taking place. Um, but some factors, there was first of all, China's crackdown on some of these regions where they restricted travel to these areas in Southeast Asia where they knew this type of activity was taking place. And then obviously COVID completely halted travel altogether. Um, so you had this um, the supply of labor basically was turned off overnight. Yet at the same time, you had this huge demand for online, not just online betting, but other online entertainment um, from people stuck at home in lockdown, bored, and maybe with more disposable income because they weren't spending money on, on other ent forms of entertainment and success increasingly susceptible to these type of cyber scams where people fake relationships and, and people stuck at home finding, you know, maybe a human connection that was exploited by these type of groups. The modus operandi is really, as we discussed, you know, typically fake job advertisements promising, you know, lucrative roles in IT or marketing or customer support. You get there, your passport's taken away and you're, you're hauled off to these compounds and you're forced to um, promote illegal betting or scam victims. Um, fines for breaking arbitrary rules uh, to hold you in debt bondage, physical, mental abuse for failing to meet arbitrary targets, including literal torture um, and quite harrowing women forced into sex work if they fail to meet targets uh, and you can't leave without paying a ransom and you'll be sold or traded between these operators. The The picture on the right here is from an, an article where they found a telegram group of these operators where they uh, buy and sell people. And if, if you can't see, it says, I'm selling a Chinese man in, in Cambodia. I just smuggled him from China, but he types very slow. Uh, if your company doesn't mind having a slow typer, you come talk to me, 10,000 US dollars to to literally buy this person who's been there three days. Uh, and that's just one of many, many examples. Um, what do they do there? In, in terms of sports betting, uh, public reporting has shown that many of the, the largest illegal sports betting operators have operations in these type of compounds. I blurred out the names just for safety's sake, but uh, it's widely reported who some of these operators are. Some of them even sponsor well-known football teams, as this article from the excellent journalists at Josie Moore on the screen shows. Um, they found evidence of, of one of these operators advertising for these type of compounds and actually promising no human trafficking at our place, which I think if you have to mention that, it's maybe a bad sign in itself. And then in terms of horse racing, there is evidence that CityBet, which is the largest illegal betting platform for horse racing in the world with turnover comparable or even larger than the legal horse racing markets in some description, uh, is based in, somewhere in Cambodia. Uh, we don't know exactly where, but we, we know it has operations there. And victim testimony tells about the sort of operations. So people will be held to promote sports betting on social media, recruit customers on chat apps. They have pirate live broadcasts of major sports events where they're promoting the betting alongside, encouraging people to bet. You have relationship managers trying to sort of become friends with the, the customers and, oh, this game's on. Do you, why don't you have a bet on that? And so on. And one report even tells how um, the during the Euro 2020 championships, the... Uh, the targets and the, and the 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 kind of enslavery aspect of it was ramped up to an, a whole other level because that tournament is such a big demand driver for betting. Um, so on one floor you might have uh, hundreds of th or thousands of people promoting the illegal betting. On another floor you might have them promoting online casino operations. On another floor you might have them promoting the cyber scam operations. Uh, the, 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 the most notorious is what's called pig butchering, which is gets its name from like fattening up the victim before slaughtering them. And it's, essentially, it's, it's like a romance scam where they'll message, I guess, literally 
thousands of people a day hoping for that one person to take the bait and reply um typically pretending to be attractive people young women especially but not only and they'll build up a, a relationship over the messaging apps and then um and then start talking about oh you know i'm i'm investing typically in crypto i've got a, a sure thing uh and then they they encourage the victims to transfer money uh, typically in the cryptocurrency tether um uh, until the point where they've got they feel they've got enough or as much as they can from the victim and then they'll uh, butcher them which is just cutting them off completely and there's essentially no recourse no way to get your money back uh, the people behind tether as this bloomberg journalist on the screen found um it don't really help anybody find where the money ended up and the other picture on the screen is a typical script that some journalists found from a victim. So there's quite advanced training scripts and the technology reported by victims, very advanced messaging apps that can message thousands of people instantly, instantaneously, instantaneously translate messages into multiple languages, etc. cetera. Um, and just as an aside, it's interesting that Tether is the, the cryptocurrency of choice uh, because it is also the cryptocurrency of choice in the type of illegal betting operations. The picture on the bottom left of the screen is from a training video for a typical uh, illegal betting website where they explain to customers how to open an account at a cryptocurrency exchange and transfer Tether to start gambling with. Um, so we looked at four jurisdictions uh, we could have looked at several more, unfortunately, um, because it's not only in these four jurisdictions, um, but obviously time permitting, we looked at these four. The, the Philippines, in, in a way, sort of led this industry in the early 2000s, where they, they saw some potential money to be made, and they set up a, an, a licensing regime for online betting, which are called POGOs, Philippines Offshore Gam Gambling Operators. Um, Obviously, being licensed in the Philippines confers no legality anywhere else, but it, it gave these operators a, a kind of sheen of legitimacy where the customers visiting these websites could see, oh, it's, it's licensed. That must mean it's legal or it's okay. Um, and, and there's many, many of these so-called pogo compounds or pogo hubs, licensed and unlicensed alike. And there's been extensive negative impacts in the Philippines um, in terms of violent crime, kidnapping, trafficking, to the point where uh, several senators have called for the complete shutdown of the industry, and not least because uh, there's been essentially very few of the financial benefits which were promised, uh, at least to the, the ordinary people in the Philippines. I'm, I'm sure some people in the Philippines are getting very rich off this industry. Um, even just last week, there was a widely reported case of one of these hubs uh, being raided by law enforcement, 700 plus victims rescued. And uh, the videos online are, are quite shocking. The literal torture chambers with um, handcuffs on railings, baseball bats, electronic cattle prods. Um, so people would be handcuffed and tortured in these in this place for presumably failing to meet targets. And there was an, also an, an 80 room on-site brothel where women had been trafficked into sex work to serve the other people working in this uh, facility. And, that, and this is, again, far from unique. It, it's sort of the standard operating procedure. And again, the, the video here at the bottom from Philippines News, it's, it's blurry, but I can tell because I look at these sort of websites far too often that these websites on the screen are your typical illegal betting websites. Um, we also looked at Cambodia, which has perhaps been the most widely covered because the, the extent and the scale and the, the egregiousness of, of the situation there was, uh, basically drew global attention in, in 2022. Um, it, there's various regions in Cambodia where this takes place. Uh, one of the main ones is Sihanoukville, which was a sleepy kind of backpacker beach town until around 2017, where they started a, a gambling licensing regime. And these huge compounds started cropping up. The one on the screen is known as Chinatown locally. And all of these 
tower blocks here on the, the right of the screen are reportedly housing as many as 12,000 workers in promoting this illegal online betting and cyber scams. And, and there's actually more in this particular development which aren't in the picture. Um, there's walled off complexes guarded by armed security. And then, but the, the job of these armed guards is to keep people in, not keep them out. And uh, as I said, unfortunately, it's far from unique. Um, there are also other areas in Cambodia where this takes place. Uh, we also looked at Myanmar. Um, essentially, it's the exact same situation. Actually, I shouldn't say that. It's not the exact same. It's actually worse. But it's the same kind of modus operandi as in Cambodia. And indeed, many of the operators moved or expanded from Cambodia into Myanmar around 2019 when Cambodia briefly looked like clamping down on their own local industry. But the situation is worse in Myanmar for political reasons. They, you know, there's uh, the obvious struggle between the, the junta there and various armed militias and parts of the country are essentially lawless or run by warlords or militias who it seems are in uh, close cooperation with the organized crime groups who run these compounds. And as the UN representative says on this slide, the situation is a governance nightmare. It's out of control. Um, some of the people involved, I won't go into great detail, you can read more in the report, but suffice to say, they, they all have quite similar backgrounds uh, and been involved in illegal betting since the 90s. Uh, many of them even convicted uh, for illegal betting operations in, in the billions in several cases, uh, yet have uh, fled captivity, been fugitive, found safe haven in some of these areas in elsewhere in Asia. Um, uh, closest, close ties to Macau. Uh, some of them were active in Macau and spread across Asia. Um, close ties to organized crime. Involvements in very dubious cryptocurrency schemes. Uh, the man on the right, Juan Kwok Kai, was uh, jailed in 1998 in Macau for among other crimes, threatening to blow up the chief of police. Yet on his release in, I think, 2012, he almost immediately raised 320 million US dollars in a, a dubious cryptocurrency ICO, um, which the, the, the crypto coin has never been heard of again. And they also have very close ties to local elites. Um, the man on the far left, despite being a fugitive and wanted by Interpol, actually has a street named after him in that compound in Cambodia we just pictured. Um, another guy who I haven't named uh, provided a private jet to fly the Prime Minister of Cambodia to the United Nations. Um, and so you can imagine how the, the vast, vast sums of money involved are make it quite, uh, quite easy, perhaps, to build such close ties and close relationships. Uh, finally, we also looked at Laos, which uh, again has several so-called special economic zones. Uh, we looked at the Golden Triangle (SEZ), which is uh, in the in the border area between Myanmar, Thailand, and Laos, which is famous for many decades for drug trafficking, and continues to be the source of most or much of the methamphetamine production. And this so-called special economic zone, which is larger in area than the entire city of Macau, has been described as the world's worst SEZ, a one-stop shop for criminals, where essentially, from public reports, anything goes, huge drug trafficking, wildlife trafficking, uh, illegal betting and more. It's, part, it's owned jointly by this man at the top right, Zhao Wei, um, and the Laos government. Uh, Zhao Wei was sanctioned in 2018 by the US for alleged drug trafficking and other crimes, as you can see. Uh, doesn't seem to have much of an effect. The picture of him is of him last year receiving a, a medal of bravery from the Laos government. So it doesn't seem like the, those sanctions carry much weight in Laos. And again, it's only one of several of these type of places, as you can see from the map. And, you know, Perhaps worryingly also, Laos is, is reported to be introducing a Philippine-style online gambling licensing regime, which would obviously be hugely attractive to these type of individuals and operators. And, you know, in the event that Philippines did shut down its licensing regime, they'd simply 
up sticks and move to Laos immediately. Um, so that's a very quick whistle through what's in the in the report. I would encourage you to read it. Um, I was quite shocked at some of the harrowing tales, the victim testimony, and the sheer scale of this. I, I guess in summary, Martin, to go back to the question you asked me about 20 minutes ago, the, the key takeaways, you know, illegal betting is not a victimless crime. It's a massive funding source for transnational organized crime. This doesn't just affect people in Asia, it's it's global. You know, there's there was a case in Australia just last week, um, a huge money laundering case. So the, the guy owns a 10 million profit uh, property in, in Melbourne, I think it was, and he's linked to Cambodia. There was Singapore's biggest money laundering case uh, took place last month. Again, many of them linked to Cambodia and these type of operations. Uh, tens of thousands, it says here, it's probably hundreds of thousands of people held in these slavery com conditions. And it's probably, we've said tens of billions on this slide, it's more likely hundreds of billions being generated. And of course, racing and other sport is directly affected. And um, and yeah, it's not just us saying it, there's been recent warnings, a global warning from Interpol and an excellent report from the UN published last September, which goes into this in more detail. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there. Um, thank you for listening. Yeah, James, I think we were all listening with, with rapt attention. Um, you, you said at the start that your research in the report was open source, but I, I don't think that matters. It's, uh, it's the way you packaged it, the way you compiled the report, um, and, and how you've shown the scale of the problem and the nature of the problem, which is, which is quite harrowing. I mean, we haven't shown pictures today. If we did, yeah. we, I think some of us would be in tears, but... Um, it, it is a staggering problem, but I think most importantly, you've also shown the nature of the criminal business behind it, which we have to deal with to be impassionate, uh, uh, unpassionate about this, um, because um, it's combating the criminality, which is key to solving the problem. Um, so James, we're going to have a break while we, we, we hear from Patricia, but I'm afraid I'm going to make you work while you have your coffee. If you, as you're, you've got host rights on the webinar, if you could just check that our questions are coming in whilst you're having your sip of coffee. Um, uh, I think we have a few coming in, but I'd just like to remind everyone, please please uh, go to Q&A or Zoom chat and, um, and we'll come to questions shortly. We could overrun a bit today as well, by the way. Uh, we don't have a hard stop. I know people have work to do, I'm sure. But uh, if, if we do have more questions, we'll try and stay on because we want to hear from Patricia now as well. So Patricia, um, we, 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 although we could talk about um, the human impact of this and how awful it is, I think uh, having you as as a trained and experienced lawyer is very useful because you can you can help us understand that the legal issues and and why the law is important in the fight against the problem. Um, mm -hmm. As James has talked about, it's it's there, there clearly is a huge human trafficking problem, not just in Southeast Asia, but it's across Asia, and and as we talked about earlier, it's probably increasingly global as well in relation to some of these businesses. Um, obviously in countries where the rule of law may be limited or non-existent in the case of Myanmar, where there's civil war, for example, and hence that's where the opportunity for organized crime groups to operate and do their business across national boundaries um, comes into place. So how, how do we target this? How do we stop it? What are the legal solutions? What, what can governments do? What, what, what do you think about um, the, the, the ways that we can combat the problem? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you so much. Um, and if I could, if you don't mind me just um, making a few remarks first, just reacting to everything we've just heard earlier. Um, it was a huge learning curve for me as well. And I, I'm very grateful for the report that you've done. Um, I've, you know, heard and have been handling some cases relating to all of those uh, issues that you have been talking about, James, and um, maybe allow me to add a few tidbits of um, side stories that's related to Hong Kong, um, just to demonstrate um, how, for example, you know, these types of criminal organizations, while you're talking about how this is um, concentrated and happening in compounds in say, Cambodia, Myanmar and Laos, but how the reach is global. And not just we're talking about the, the way that they're generating money from, from people being scammed or people who fall into these traps, 
but also um, how victims are actually coming from everywhere around the world and um, returning to everywhere around the world. Um, and so what well, some of your um, slides touch on how some of the criminals involved in um, these types of schemes operate from different locations, including Hong Kong, Macau. So just because um, these compounds are in um, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, doesn't mean that um, not a huge, a significant proportion of the activities are not happening here. So um, I'm just going to mention, I think, get into that a little bit um, in the next few minutes. Um, I, I did want to focus on one thing. If Matt Friedman was here, and unfortunately he couldn't join us today, it would be to add to the remarks you made about the torture chambers being found in these sites. Um, what uh, Matt and I have been talking about recently is just um, mourning at the staggering extent of the criminality involved and, and the, the how um, the modus operandi on human trafficking is evolving. And, and to be honest, it's very disheartening for people like us that's been working in the space combating human trafficking because we've been working on, for example, combating drug trafficking, sex trafficking, illegal wildlife trafficking, and so on. And meanwhile, we now see, as you say, the supercharging of, of this whole empire happening. And it's just um, what what's really staggering to us is that um, we have to note how easy this operation is for the criminals behind it. All they're doing is they're holding a bunch of people behind compounds, they're giving them scripts to read out and to implement, and they're just cashing in. So if you have to think about um, you know, the, the mentality for the masterminds here, they're looking at this going, oh my goodness, this is so much easier than drug trafficking, sex trafficking, and all of this. Why don't I spend the rest of my time doing this? And, and the issue that I think we'll be facing is that I think uh, the rest of the world, the criminal masterminds around the world will catch up to this and everybody will join this type of idea. Um, and in fact, we are seeing patterns of this happening now around the world. I was saying, I was coming back to the torture chambers. What I think these masterminds are doing is they're trying to squeeze every bit of profit out of the scheme. So, you know, you talked about how um, the people being trafficked to this compounds have to meet certain targets every day. And if they don't meet the targets, they may be penalized in different ways or even sold to other places. Um, my understanding is that they have now started um, torturing these individuals and actually broadcasting this live. So people can actually pay to join um, these video sessions, a little bit like paying to watch porn, um, and you're actually watching people being uh, tortured. And this type of um, phenomenon seems to be spreading and um, it's certainly becoming very, very dark. Um, Bringing it back to Hong Kong, um, we have actually heard with, with the organization that um, I'm involved with, um, we've been communicating with uh, counterparts in Cambodia, and we heard of somebody who's actually not been able to meet the target, and then they've been sold to work on a fishing boat, and the fishing boat um, actually entered Hong Kong territory, and ever since um, that happened, we've not heard anything from the victim ever since. So, you know, the way that this is happening, it's certainly happening across borders and very, very quickly. So coming back, um, sorry, belatedly answering more directly Martin's question, um, you know, what it is, what is it that we can do with the law? Well, for me, I think I can address this by just highlighting how not having any human trafficking laws is um making us unable to tackle this crime. Now, maybe we could start from victims or, or individuals being handpicked by the criminal networks and um, scammed into going to these uh, buildings, these compounds to work. Um, last year, I think quite a lot of news broke out in Hong Kong around how um, quite a lot of intelligent um, uh, 
uh, Hong Kong residents, um, they, were, they were surprised because they were people who had regular jobs, were tricked into working in these compounds in Cambodia. Now, the issue that a lot of them faced was that they were actually involved in quite a lot of criminal activities. They were committing lots of crimes while they were in Cambodia. And the worry is that when they returned to Hong Kong, having you know fled from that the horrors of being in that compound, um, that they would end up being prosecuted for maybe committing various crimes involving, say, people who have been scammed in Hong Kong. Um, and at that point, there were discussions around how, well, we really need to introduce um, legislation to allow them to have a defense to say that those crimes were committed in the course of them being a victim of human trafficking so that they can you know, have the prosecutions against them dropped and, and there be a humane solution. Um, and that was discussed back then. What we have seen since is that fortunately they've been identified as victims of human trafficking in Hong Kong and the authorities haven't actually gone ahead to prosecute them, which got around this question because they didn't need a defense after all. But the issue remains is that we don't actually have such a defense in Hong Kong. So that was one, one thing to look at. Um, the other thing is that, for example, you know, if within, um, say, investigators, say they uh, find some individuals who are being scammed and, and they're being, um, well, tricked to go to these compounds, if they identify these individuals, the authorities don't actually have any powers to stop them from going to countries overseas. Now, um, in the UK, as an example, there are pieces of legislation that allows the police to issue stop orders or apply for stop orders from the court to stop these individuals from going. And um, if, you know, we have something like that, it would certainly help. Um, the other scenario that I have in mind is we talked about um, companies that actually may be based in Hong Kong, maybe incorporated in Hong Kong. And um, do you know what a lot of these companies are? They may be accounting firms. Um, they may be people who are um, handling the money laundering for these individuals. Um, we know for sure. I mean, it's no surprise that Hong Kong's a um, center for laundering money. Um, a lot of the money from from these criminal syndicates come through here. Um, and you know what I can share is I actually have a very good friend who was giving a talk recently to a group of accountants. And uh, I think they were doing um, some training around due diligence and KYC procedures and things like that. And um, there were actually accountants who said, oh, you know, if um, one of my clients happens to be one of these companies that James, you actually named, um, do you think I should continue working for them? <laughs> and, and, and these questions were asked actually publicly. And you're wondering how many accountants are actually working for these individuals in Hong Kong, um, unwittingly or, or knowingly. Um, you know, and, and if there's more actions around um, the following the money type of work in Hong Kong by the authorities, I have no doubt you have more people behind um, these syndicates arrested. Um, unfortunately, there's just a lack of... Um, not only laws, but also policies that that um, enable the law enforcement departments in Hong Kong to investigate into these types of syndicates um, from a human trafficking standpoint. So there's very little work that's been done. But I must say, you know, even if we didn't have human trafficking laws, there probably can be action taken uh, if they look at it from the angle of money laundering. So you know, as I think for, for all of us, what we can do is as reports like this come out and we, as we con sit, continue to name individuals, I think it would empower them to actually take more action and hopefully, you know, see see some work done there. Um, I think, I think, you know, in terms of looking at the laws, that's all I have to comment just briefly for now, but I'm happy to answer any further questions. I can give you the first question from, from the audience as well, just to um, because I know you've done a lot of work with victims, and um, and, and we have one question in the Q and A. Um, is there a pattern that you've seen if there are certain countries or region from where there are more people being trafficked? But I think this comes down to victims of, of this area of crime 
uh, and you've done a lot of work, you said, as an advocate for victims. Where, where, where do you see most victims coming from? And we know groups on this panel that they're from all over Asia, but primarily, and why are victims from certain places? Perhaps you could say something about the economic, social, cultural reasons for this as well. Oh, well, this has been morphing over the last few years. Um, right at the beginning, a lot of the victims were coming from Taiwan. Um, now, when you think about how these syndicates can target victims, usually they can do so, they can target them when they don't know much better. So they were very successful in targeting a lot of Taiwanese um, uh, people to go to these compounds to work. But what happened was, you know, the population got around to knowing about these types of plans and uh, how the tricks um, were happening, how what sort of um, job ads were put out and what, what were fake job ads. Um, and as news got around, it became more difficult for the syndicates syndicates to target individuals from Taiwan. So they moved, you know, they moved to start targeting individuals from uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, and, you know, surprisingly, I think for the Hong Kong population, victims from Hong Kong as well. Um, the other thing that's been happening along the way is that these, um, the, the modus operandi was, they were maturing. They were becoming smarter and smarter with the ideas. So in the beginning, they were just, for example, they will call people to say, give us this much money or else we'll kill your relative. Um, but as time moved on, they came up with plans that made it less um, threatening. Um, they have dating scams, they have crypto scams and online betting scams. But you could think, uh, imagine that as they developed these more mature techniques, they needed more IT experts, as James mentioned earlier. Uh, they needed people who knew more languages, better at English. I think that's why, um, as time went on, the victims that they they were um, bringing into these compounds come from more educated backgrounds, um, and they come from um, wealthier jurisdictions as well. What I think we're seeing now is that we're seeing people from India. India, from Middle East and from South America as well. I mean, it's definitely becoming very much global. At this point, I don't know which jurisdictions are left out. Um, but yeah, I think there's a the, the last thing I will say is it morphs to places where this pattern is less known. So if, for example, I think in Europe where it's less known, you're seeing more victims and more people being scammed at this point. But news will go around and then they'll have to come up with new ideas. I, I think it's a very good point, Tricia. And um, I think you've hit on, on the crux of the problem that there's a lot of growth left for criminals in, in this area, sadly, um, because there are a lot of countries where the, the MO isn't understood or known. Um, there's an awful lot of places where there are people desperate for, for money, economic benefits of fake, from fake jobs. Um, so that, that's why we have to address this. It's clearly a huge problem. Um, and, and to switch back to the business aspects of it. So, James, we, we, you know, we've studied the business of illegal betting, illegal gambling, and then its relation to organized crime for, for a long time now. So perhaps I can put a couple of the questions to, if you don't mind, put them together in the interest of time. Um, firstly, we have from, uh, from Stephen, there are a lot of links available for online gambling, but why not robustly taken down by authorities? I think this relates to enforcement action. Perhaps you could say something about that, but against the business of these criminal enterprises. And also from BC Tan, um, very, very nice to see you, BC, on here. Um, uh, thanks, James. Are the illegal gambling operations and scam operations the same operators? I think you can address that quite easily. And do you see this industry decriminalizing with other organized crime groups collaborating? We're noticing Koreans, Vietnamese, and Africans now being trafficked. Echoing, I think, Patricia's comments there. So I think there's a couple of things you, you could help us to address there. Why isn't enforcement action successful at the moment? Patricia touched on that earlier. Um, and, and how do you see the organized crime aspects of this developing as per BC's question? Yeah, so I mean, from a simple technical point of view, are do people take websites down? Yes, um, many, many jurisdictions uh, proactively block these websites at the ISP level 
Singapore's gambling regulatory authority takes down, I don't know how many hundreds, thousands. China certainly takes down thousands. Uh, Australia and many countries in Europe maintain blacklists of unlicensed operators who are targeting their um, their people uh, in contravention of the law. Um, Hong Kong does not um, do so. And, you know, other jurisdictions may or may not have the capacity. But, you know, it's it's debatable, the, the efficacy of it. So, yeah, you can take down one URL, but without going into too much technical detail, these betting websites and the the associated scam websites, they will have hundreds, if not thousands, of what are called mirror websites. So you take down one URL, you take down betting123.com, and the customers are instantly migrated to betting456.com. And 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 the, this has been the case for many years. And, and like I said, you know, they kind of applied this modus operandi to the, the scams as well. Um, and sometimes quite sophisticated websites, you know, seemingly legitimate cryptocurrency or investment platforms that are obviously completely fake. So it's a bit of a game of whack-a-mole. You know, yes, I, th I think trying to take down websites and, and stop is better than not trying to take that, them down at all. Um, but it's it's perhaps of limited effic efficacy. And as, you know, as Patricia mentioned, this is one reason for the trafficking demand that they need IT experts um, to be constantly setting these websites up all the time. Um, I think that the other question, uh, is it the same operators who run the scams and illegal betting? Um, from all we can see, yes. Um, certainly at the the top of the pyramid, as it were. I mean, some of these compounds, you know, I mentioned the one in um, in uh, in Laos, which is actually bigger than the entire city of Macau. So you, you there there literally be hundreds of different operations going on there, and to the extent that they're top down, centrally controlled, I, I honestly don't know, or. But you know, ultimately, I, I guess it's it's all feeding up into the kind of kingpin types of the the type of people we showed on one of those slides where we had the different individuals. So yes, it is the same operators, and and they have, I think, as Patricia says, you know, <clears throat> these these guys and and these groups, they're not married to one business model. They're they're not going to only do illegal betting because they like gambling. They will go anywhere and anywhere where they can make a buck, and whether that's selling tiger parts or for medicine or illegal logging or um, uh, methamphetamine trafficking and production, you know, they'll do whatever they want, and they'll funnel money into legitimate enterprises as well. So, I think a key point is that you know they had this very lucrative online betting business. They've now found this other business model, um, which is complementary in many ways, but it also expands the what's called in business the total addressable market of customers greatly. Because if you think about it, only a small population, a percentage of the population, like to gamble or have an interest in sports and would bet on sports betting. But probably almost all of us can be attracted to what seems like a great investment opportunity or an attractive person seemingly wanting to be our friends. You know, there's many people who would never ever click on a random WhatsApp message promoting gambling, but there's many more who might click on some of these other scam avenues. Um, so, so it's, it's greatly, it, it's at least doubled their profits, uh, perhaps orders of magnitude more. And then I think the other question was, um, you know, in terms of locations, uh, is it is it spreading? Are they collaborating with other organized crime groups? I, I think the answer, again, has to be yes. There was a story in the media last week from Peru, where I think, I forget the exact number, but 40 or 50 Malaysian people had been trafficked to work in one of these compounds in Peru. So I think, as Patricia mentioned, they'll spread as it becomes known in one region or as the regulatory pressure increases, 
they'll go elsewhere where it's not as well known and people being trafficked from Asia to Peru. And they'll obviously have to be collaborating with the local criminal groups there in South America. We know they're operating in the Middle East and in, in Eastern Europe. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see Africa um, emerging. There have been increasing stories of Africans being trafficked um, and, and people of different nationalities, essentially all over the world. I mean, Interpol issued a, a global warning on this last month, or, or maybe it was before, a bit before that, I think it was July, but they, they call it a global threat. It, it's not just Asia, it's not just localised. I think you, you, you nailed it, James, um, with quite a few re really excellent points there, especially the point about business lines and um, and how criminal groups uh, say that it's not just a bunch of guys who like gambling, it's, uh, it's a bunch of guys who will deliver any service you want. Um, I, I particularly recall in Hong Kong some years ago interviewing uh, someone in the racing uh, industry or sector um, about uh, their visits to um, brothels in, uh, in Kowloon. Uh, and, and that person telling me that um, you know, what, what they went there for was um, um, sex, gambling, which was available in the same brothel, and drugs. They're, they're all three just business lines, um, and criminals will find whichever business line is profitable. So uh, this on a, on a vast scale geographically now. Um, we're, we're, we're going up to... Um, up to the line with time, uh, but, I, but I want to sort of give a closing question if I could to, uh, to Patricia. Um, Patricia, we have one from Widya, um, which is uh, ASEAN has a legally binding convention against trafficking in persons and the leaders recently signed a declaration on combating trafficking in persons. Do you see any positive impact happening on the ground? And I think that relates to a couple of the other questions relating to, again, what can we do or what can governments do about this? Does that sort of convention and treaty have an impact, do you think? Is that part of the solutions to this? Um, how, how would you call for governments to take action? Uh, should they be doing more tangible things? Mm. Or are treaties the answer for collaboration or, or both? Mm. Well, thanks for the question. Um, first of all, I'd say that there is an impact. Um, the impact is that we're talking about human trafficking, we're acknowledging about its existence, we're using it as a measuring stick. It's good to have a measuring stick and it, it's a starting point. But um, of course, the question is about, I mean, as your question indicates, what's happening in practice and how it's being, being implemented. Um, in fact, I think if you just, if I could loop back to James's um, presentation where he showed us photographs of um, some of the leaders in some of these countries giving awards to the criminal masterminds. I think that says volumes about how this is working out on the ground. You can have these laws, we, they could pay lip service to them, but whether any enforcement action is happening is a whole different matter. And of course, that's completely um, wound up with bribes and things like that. But, you know, having said that, I wouldn't drop this altogether, right? Because as I said just now, it's still a measuring stick. Um, countries have to answer to questions. The international community can say, you know, are, are you adhering to your duties? Um, lawyers like myself can, you know, bring individuals to the courts to say, you know, here's your duties and it seems like you're breaching them and then call for penalties and um, sanctions. So, you know, there, there is a, a point in that. Um, it's just that when you look at just the economic incentives with this particular issue, um, I will definitely be the first to acknowledge that law is not an answer to this. It's just one of the things we can use to tackle this. Patricia, thank you very much. Um, I think we'd better stop there. We've got a lot of questions, but we're at 9.05 and um, uh, some people will be going to work or, uh, or, or going to the next meeting or, or, or wanting to go home. So um, we'd we better be disciplined. Uh, I, I'd like to apologize to, to all of the, the people who put questions up. We're really grateful for them. Um, perhaps next time we can schedule a bit longer as well. An hour and a half might be better. Some people might stay on. Uh, and, and we'll come back to this topic. I mean, James's report um, with the Mekong Club is is really timely and really incisive. It's, it's I think, the best I've read on the subject uh, because you address it so well, James. And, and Patricia, it's really reassuring and heartening to hear someone who has been in the middle of this 
fight against this criminal problem of human trafficking for some years and, um, and understands how to combat it, because that does give us some hope given the scale of what we see from James's report and what we've all agreed is probably the likely growth of this problem geographically, that, um, that we do need solutions. So th thank you very much for joining us and, and being positive about this, um, Patricia. James, thank you very much for all of your work and for going through it today. And thank you very much for everyone for, for turning up for the webinar. I do hope you've um, taken something from it. As you can see on the screen, please go and have a look at the report, uh, which is on the ARF website. Um, and you can subscribe to updates. We publish quite a lot these days, bi-weekly newsletters, standalone publications, and a quarterly uh, journal. Um, so uh, please go and have a look at the website and you can find more about that. Please also have a look at the Mekon Club. And, and my thanks again to, to Matt and his team at the Mekon Club for, for agreeing to collaborate on this. Sorry we didn't see you here today, Matt, but we'll, we'll see you next time and come back to this subject. Thank you very much, everyone. And Martin, maybe, maybe just to add, because there are quite a few questions and I probably talked too long, but if people do have questions and, and want to you know, reach out to me or find out more, I think you can get the contact details on the asianracing.org illegal betting section of the website. So I think there's a, either my email address or, or a contact form on there and uh, you know, happy to uh, exactly. take questions by email or, or et, et cetera. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Thank, thank you very you. much.